Good morning. So today we'll be giving our presentation on the integumentary system of seahorses. I will be one of your presenters today, Aaron Rodriguez, as well as Kaylin Parton and Christina Gonzalez. So what is the integumentary system and why is it so important? The integumentary system consists of our skin, our nails, hair, and exocrine glands. Our skin acts as a barrier from the outside environment and it also protects us. It is one of the biggest organs in our body. Today, we'll be further discussing about the morphology, how it looks, function, how it works, and the evolution of seahorse skin. What is morphology? So morphology is a study of the form of things. In specific, how does a seahorse look like? So in the picture to your right is the general structure or the general morphology of a seahorse. The seahorse, even though it looks so much different compared to a fish, it is actually a fish. The only difference is that the seahorse has a presence of skin rather than scales. It also has a presence of a dorsal fin, a pectoral fin, and an anal fin. Within the skin of the seahorse, you can find different types of rings as well as different bony plates that are important for their protection as well as for the survival within um, the sea. It is also scientifically named as the hippocampus. So characteristics, seahorses actually have very distinct characteristics that make them different from fishes. So instead of scales, seahorses actually have thin skin that stretched over a series of bony plates. Even though they're considered a type of bony fish, they actually do not have scales. Within these bony plates, there are visible rings that are found within, within the trunk. Within these rings, on, the, on their upper part of their body, they have around 11 rings, all the way to you get to their trunk, where there's 31 to 39 rings uh, stretching to their toe. Their spe a specific characteristic is that on their toe, it's shaped like a monkey, and you can find um, these uh, rings so close together that you can even count them, and each species has a distinct number of rings. Some species also have spines, they have bony bumps, skin filaments that protrude from these, type, from these bony rings. Seahorses can even grow bits of skin that looks similar to seaweed that helps them hide better. So color variety in seahorses. Seahorses are so distinct that they have a variety of different colors and different patterns. Their skin color ranges from brown, yellow, orange, and even red. These colors have a specific function, which will be further discussed in Caitlin's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin, and now that Erin has talked a little bit about the morphology of the seahorse, or how it looks, I'm going to look at how these morphologies help them or what their functions are. First, I wanted to define what camouflage is. So what is camouflage? Camouflage is used by many animals to almost become invisible or at least make it more difficult to see them. The way that organisms do this is through the visible parts of their outer bodies. They can use a similar color as their surrounding, as seen by the seahorse in the picture to the right, which has this really pretty yellow color that matches the yellow coral it is holding onto with its tail. This can also be called cryptic coloration. Animals can also have textures or appendages that make them look like a branch, leaf, or even a stalk of coral. The reason that this is so important for some animals to be able to camouflage into their environment is so that they cannot be seen by predators that may want to eat them, and because they cannot move very fast, it is crucial for them to be able to hide in this way. If you were to look at a seahorse, such as the other two pictures at the bottom, you would notice that both seahorses not only have the same colors as the coral they are holding onto, but they also have bumps and other textures that make them look like someone just copy and pasted their skin from the coral itself. They are using a technique called mimicry to do this. These little pink bumps that kind of look like pimples that I have circled right here in the green are what are known as tubercles. 
and help the seahorse to get to again match the way that the coral looks better looks to better hide them from danger. So not only are seahorses able to mimic the way that their environment looks, but they are also able to change color, kind of like an octopus would. I think that this is pretty cool, and I'm about to show you why through an experiment that was done by scientists. But first, let me explain to you why seahorses would want or need to change their color. First, seahorses tend to change color when they are approaching their boyfriend or girlfriend. Seahorses tend to mate for life, so this is something that happens almost every day. When the girl and boy seahorses come back together after being separated to find food or whatever it is they are doing, they greet each other by changing the color of their skin. It is kind of a way to let the other one know that they recognize each other and to say hello. The next reason that a seahorse would want to change color is if it were to be put into another environment. So this is where it gets interesting. At first, scientists were never able to observe a seahorse changing colors until this, this experiment was done on a pygmy seahorse, and they get their name because of how small they are, as you can see in the picture to the left with the orange coral. There is a small pygmy seahorse clinging onto the side of the orange coral that is indicated by the two centimeter line that is drawn. Scientists first thought that maybe the seahorse simply found a coral that matched the color of their bodies, but it turns out that they're able to turn color. I found this video on YouTube that I linked in this slide where biologists caught a girl and boy pygmy seahorse that were orange like the one in the picture to the left, put them in an aquarium, and let them have babies. When the babies were born, they looked brown like the picture in the middle. Then the biologist took out the orange coral and added a purple coral instead to see if the babies would grow up to be purple or if they would stay orange like the parents. It turns out they grow up to be purple, just like the picture to the right. The third reason that a seahorse might change color is because of their mood. If they feel threatened or see another seahorse that looks like competition, they will change color as a warning. So how do they cause this color change? Well, as I mentioned before, they do this the same way an octopus would, which is through the use of chromatophores that are in their skin. Chromatophores are cells that are able to change from big to small, which push the color pigment around. But you have to remember that seahorses do not have every color of pigment like blue, green, brown, red, purple, and so on. So they combine their pigments or mix them around kind of like you would do with paint in order to get the color that they want. Alrighty guys, the moment you have all been waiting for. It's game time. So for this game, there are going to be pictures shown on the screen of an environment that has a seahorse hidden somewhere in it because of their use of camouflage. Your job is to see if you can find it. You're going to have a total of eight seconds to try and find the seahorse as fast as you can. And then when you find it, press the yes option on the pole that is going to pop up. If the eight seconds are up and you are not able to spot the seahorse, press no on the pull options. Are you ready? Here is the first picture. Can you see the seahorse? You have eight seconds starting now. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, stop. Press yes or no depending on if you were able to spot the seahorse. Okay guys, here's another one. Can you see the seahorse? Your time starts now. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Stop and submit your answer. Okay guys, here's the last one. This one is a little tricky, but I think you can do it. Your time starts now. Eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one. Stop and submit your answers. Great job, everyone. Give yourself a round of applause. And now we're going to have Christina talk about the evolution of seahorse integumentary system. Hi, everyone. So I know so far we have learned about the morphology about a seahorse, which includes their skin and how they don't have scales. 
as well as how their color varies and then also about how they have camouflage and how they use that and how they can change colors. Now all of these are important when it comes to the seed force because as we continue with our lesson we are going to focus more about how evolution of their body has helped them adapt and survive in their, in their environments. So seahorses are amazing creatures that are well suited for their environment. They have numerous body parts which give them the ability to live in the ocean, hide from prey, as well as other vital parts that give them the chance to survive in their best environment. So as we look here, we can actually see how the numbers on the picture correlate to the features that I have numbered here listed 1 through 12. So all these features have helped them or helped them in some way to survive and adapt in every environment that they live in. So first we're going to look at the pectoral fin, which are located on either side of the seahorse's body right below the gill opening. The seahorses flaps the fins back and forth in order to move, steer, and for stability. It can be seen corresponding to the number one on the picture. Moving on, we're going to look at the cornea. This is a body projection found on the top of this seahorse's head. So it's kind of like a little cone or a little peak that you can see corresponding to the number two. Depending how thick and how high the cornet is, it can help identify the species of the seahorse. It is believed that cornets are similar to human fingerprints, and each seahorse has a unique cornet. So I thought that was very cool. Moving on to number three, which is their eyes. Seahorses have two eyes, which have the ability to move in different directions. Their magnificent eyes allow the seahorse to find more food as well as watch out for predators. You can see that corresponding to the number three on the picture as well. So moving on to number four, which is their snout. The long snout of a seahorse is an adaptation used for foraging for food, which just means for finding food. The snout is similar to a straw and sucks up the seahorse's food, such as zooplankton. Because of their snout is so long, only a small turn of the head is necessary to reach prey faster, which disability seahorses can get more food. And who doesn't want more food? Moving on to number five, the broad pouch, which is only found in seahorses, is located underneath the anal fin and is used to incubate the eggs from a female seahorse. Now you can't see this on the picture, but it's located right under the anal fin, which is number six. The anal fin is found at the body of a seahorse's abdomen. The fin helps stabilize the seahorse. In males, scientists believe it may assist in reproduction in the reproduction process. Moving on to number seven, this which is the dorsal fin. The fin is located on the midline of the seahorse's back, as you can see in the picture, number seven. Since the body of a seahorse is vertical, the fin extends directly behind the body. Seahorses aren't very fast swimmer. So the dorsal fin powers through waves that passes along it. Moving on to number eight, which is the tail. Seahorses actually lack a tail fin, so they are dependent upon their peripheral tail, meaning that just means it has the ability to hold onto rocks. So it's kind of like, I like to think of as like a claw-like feature. They can hold onto rocks, corals or other objects and allows the seahorse to be anchored in one position. You can see the little the little swirl shape it makes at the very end. Seahorses use their tails in a number of different ways such as in their mating rituals as well. Moving on to number nine which is the gallbladder which is the swim bladder an internal gas filled organ found in seahorses allows the seahorse to control its ability to move up and down. This is a great adaptation for the seahorse to not waste a lot of energy swimming. You can't really see it in number nine because it is an internal gas filled organ, but it would be somewhere where the number nine is pointing to on the picture. Moving on to number 10, which is gills. Gills are the 
respiratory organ found in seahorses. Those extract dissolved or oxygen from water and then excrete carbon dioxide back into the water. Gills are adaptations for the seahorse because they create more surface area. More surface area means more oxygen and less waste. Moving on to number 11, which are protective plates. Seahorses actually have bony plates, which are located under the skin, much like a suit of armor. These plates are an adaptation, allowing protection for the seahorses against predators. So it's like they have an extra layer to protect them and make it get harder to them. And lastly is, of course, you can't really see it on the picture, but it helps a lot in whatever environment the seahorses are located in, and that is camouflage. Seahorses also have the ability to change colors. They can change colors for multiple reasons, such as during their court dates with a mate or possibly to hide from a predator. With the seahorse's ability to camouflage, it makes hiding from a predator much easier. This adaptation is a great survival tool. So after learning about these, these are just a few ways that it uses its body and how its body has gone through evolution to kind of help them survive wherever they are. So after learning about the specific features that have evolutionized for a seahorse, we are now going to look at more specific aspect of it in just how its environment has actually played a vital role in them. So what exactly is evolution? Evolution is how a species changes over many generations. And a species, just to uh, further elaborate, is all the animals of one kind. So all, for example, it could be all cats or all turtles. As we know, there are many different turtles and many different cats. In specific, we are looking at how the expansion of seagrass habitats have driven seahorse evolution. An important event that took place and was essential to the evolution of seahorses was a collision of Australia and New Guinea, which resulted in the formation of vast shallow water areas where there had previously been deeper water. The fossil records indicate that seagrass meadows quickly established themselves throughout new habitats. And you can see in the picture with the big pink arrow pointing at is that's what seagrass meadows would look like. So to further elaborate, here's how their evolution takes place. And you might be asking, how would the expansion of seagrass habitats have driven seahorse evolution? It is generally agreed that the most likely way in which new species can establish themselves is to be isolated from species that give rise to them. Not only does this prevent mating between the two, but also prevents competition for the same resources, and in that way allows new species to increase in numbers and establish a viable population. So this evolution started off with tectonic events in the Indo-West Pacific, and this just means that land in some sort collided and created a tectonic shift in the Indo-West Pacific. And the Indo-West is a region that contains the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean, the Western and Central Pacific Ocean, and the seas connecting the two in the general area of Indonesia. The new habitat that became available provided an opportunity for the new upright seahorses to establish themselves permanently because the upright seagrass blades would have provided excellent camouflage for their bodies and in that way improve their ability to ambush prey and avoid detection from predators. Experimental data also indicate that seahorses can maneuver with ease through these highly complex habitats without getting entangled. After benefiting from the rapid expansion of seagrass meadows in Australia, seahorses, seahorses gradually established themselves in tropical and temperate regions throughout the world. How did this, how did they do this by itself extraordinary seeing that they are exceptionally poor swimmers? But perhaps that was the secret to their success. Let's imagine a scenario which a displaced pregnant male seahorse 
uses its tail to hold onto a clump of floating seaweed. This animal can potentially disperse into a new habitat at a great distance from its source habitat, and the large number of young in its pouch can immediately establish a large viable population. And although many seahorses today are extremely common in seagrass beds, many have diverse and can be found in the range of other habitats, such as coral reefs, which are still uncommon in Australia during the time seahorses evolved. So the formation of new shallow water areas associated with the expansion of seagrass habitats. These habitats favor the seahorses upright posture by improving their camouflage. They also improve their ability to ambush and avoid detection by predators and seahorses in turn maneuver with ease through these highly complex habitats without getting entangled. This in turn led to a bigger creation and a safe place for seahorses in general to expand and adapt to living and in no way just provide more for other seahorses to come. So that concludes our presentation about the integumentary system of the seahorse and its overall body. So we thank you for listening to us and hope you enjoyed it. And this is just our last slide, which includes our references.